Well, um, as, I, as I said before, uh, I've been asked to, you know, you have been two very inspiring uh, 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 people telling, you know, great, great things. I mean, providing us in the future. Um, I'm going to bring you back even more to um, what we try to do uh, in France. So um, I will talk tomorrow more in detail in my, uh, my speech tomorrow morning about the whole France Université Numérique initiative that we have been running over the last three years in France. Uh, and I would like just here to give you some points on different topics that we have seen around this initiative. Um, I'm not, okay, doesn't seem to work. Okay, I'm not going to go back to, well, well we know about the world, uh, all the technologies that we live with, all the technologies that the students live with, all the technologies that they expect us to use in the classroom, to use in their uh, uh, learning experience, because the, they want the gap between their today's life and their learning life to be as short as possible. I mean, as, okay, so I'm not going to say uh, more about that. Uh, because we, we had very, very good talk on that before. So, of course, the student, um, they, they need, they, they want these technologies to be part of their learning and part of their uh, uh, process of uh, studying. Um, I believe that there are uh, two, two issues, at least in France, uh, that are very important. Um, more and more students have to uh, work to, to pay for their studies. And because they have to work to pay for their studies, coming on campus and being there when they are on campus is more and more difficult. Uh, we all know of students who have an eight uh, o'clock class in the morning, then they will be there, but because they have been working at night, they are not really there. They do not really engage in the course and they have been sitting, but they haven't learned anything. So if they do have uh, means to go back to this course, means to look at it uh, when, when they are free, means to stay in bed because they are too tired, but they know they will be able to take the lecture later on. We know that this is going to be very helpful. So we, 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 we do understand that using digital technologies in class is obviously very important. Uh, and of course, there is all these issues about the fact that we have to focus on lifelong learners. And uh, more and more uh, people in companies, they have to come back of course, to take uh, courses, to, to train for new uh, competencies that they don't have. And digital technologies are very important for them because we all know that it's, it's quasi impossible for uh, a company to have someone very precious to go away for a week to, to study. So if we can combine online learning and on-site learning for what is important, then of course for companies, for the workers, it's going to be uh, another very uh, important uh, facilitation. On the, on the professor's side, I'm not going to come back. We know that practicing digital pedagogy is time consuming. They don't know how to do it. Um, there is a big change for a professor when he goes to digital technology and, and digital, uh, you know, all of you who have been teaching over the last 20 years, it has been a very uh, private and individual work. You would prepare your course wherever you wanted. Uh, if you want to use digital technology to provide really a very good digital pedagogy, then you have to work collectively. And we have had a couple of professors coming in, sharing this experience in our uh, seminars that we do organize from time to time, saying that this has been a, a huge change in their uh, practice. Um, because, you know, I remember one professor who, who came to, 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 to share his experience and he said, um, before I did this first MOOC, uh, I always thought that I was um, uh, the only person that counted besides God in my class. And he just had it, as I don't believe in God, I've always been the only person that counted in that class. And then my, my university asked me to create a MOOC. And I jumped in this without knowing what would happen to me. And he told to the whole audience that 
he would never have been able to do it without all those people who helped him to do it. With all these instructional designers, all the people who manage the project, all the people who do the videos, all these guys who are behind the, the camera and who ask uh, and are willing to stay four hours for a 10 minute video at the end. I mean, this is really a huge change for, for the teachers. I'm not going to go back to incentive, of course. Uh, and on the side of institution, of course, there are important issues as well. Uh, going on, on, on MOOCs, do, do, doing very, very visible digital uh, contents and digital courses is, of course, a matter of visibility or attractiveness. We already had great discussion this morning about the fact that it doesn't work if there isn't a very, very strong policy and if uh, the, 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 I mean, the president or whoever is running the university is not willing to, to, to be, to, 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 how should I say that in English? I mean, to make sure that it works and to put money in it and to put people in it and, and, and to do it on the long term, which is also something of an issue. Um, so this is uh, the, the picture of the fun platform. What, what we have learned over the last couple of, uh, small couple of years on, on, on the platform, uh, looking at students taking MOOCs and looking at teachers taking MOOCs. What is very interesting is that when you ask a student who has a professor in class and who is taking the MOOC of this professor, all these students, they will say, I'd rather prefer to take this lecture in the MOOC than in the classroom. It doesn't mean that the MOOC is the only activity for the student, because of course he still goes on campus and he still has uh, uh, activities with the professor, and it's a way to really encourage flipped classroom. But what is really very clear is that the student, the on-campus student who are taking MOOCs with their own professors, they rather prefer the MOOC than the professor. And uh, what is also very interesting is that all the professors who have been doing MOOCs, they all say to the audience when we ask them, what, what have you learned? Is that they have improved their teaching and they don't teach the same way they used to teach before. I remember uh, a professor from, uh, of epidemiology who um, told us a couple of months ago in our seminar that when he, he was ready to do the MOOC, he, he had a very good first introductory uh, course on a master level, and he had that meant huge, I mean, a, a huge amount of slides, and he came to the supporting team saying, look, I have my slides, where is the camera? I'm going to start shooting. And then, of course, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, and they started to ask him to work very hard to, to think about the course, to recreate the course to be, uh, to, to be uh, efficient for such an audience. And such an audience, as Jeff said, is you have to have short videos, you have to uh, go straight to the point, uh, you have to mix videos and exercises and activities and peer-to-peer and -peer, uh, uh, activities and so on and so forth. So what he said is that, the year after that, he had to take this on-campus class again, his epidemiology course, and he has this many number of slides. And because he did the MOOC, then he spent quite a few weeks during the summer to review these, these slides. And he realized that he could say the same thing by a, a, a much less number of slides. So he came back to the class with less slides doing and teaching the same thing. And what's very interesting is that a year later, the third year, then he, asked, he said that he doesn't need that much hour that he used to need to teach. So I really think that, you know, in what's going on about creating these very um, innovative courses, even though we may discuss about how innovative they are, but for the teachers, this is really an innovation to think about the way he teach and to teach differently, there is really a big impact. And of course, uh, what we have seen on FUN uh, around this initiative is that um, institutions are willing to develop more uh, fully online curricula, but what is really uh, more, not more important, but also uh, quite important is that universities are starting to realize that they could use those courses and really uh, practice more uh, flipped classroom, blended learning, and in France, where we are used to have, you know, these main lecture halls, and then 
this is really a big change in, in, uh, in the practices. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, initiatives that we have had having in France over the last three years, not only on the France Université Numérique MOOC platform. Um, we have uh, launched a couple of, well, we launched three years ago and it has been renewed uh, uh, last year, um, uh, a portal which is really for higher education uh, institution in France. So it's really the, the place where you will have all the information on not only MOOCs, but on um, um, what are the serious game initiatives that there are in France, uh, what are the online uh, curricula that you can have in France, um, what are the various initiatives that there is in one university or another university. And on, on this side, there is also um, um, an engine, a search engine that can go on uh, three, no, 30, 100 open education resources that have been created over the last, let's say, 10 years in France. So uh, this is something that is uh, quite, uh, quite important um, and where um, we, we, have, we have a long tradition of, uh, you know, supporting uh, uh, open education resources in France and they are accessible from this national portal through a, a search engine. Uh, and I would also add that um, uh, last year, I believe, uh, a francophone portal has been created under the supervision of uh, Organisation Universitaire de la Francophonie, l'Association Universitaire de la Francophonie, AUF, and International uh, uh, Organization for Francophonie. And they, they use the same sort of engine, and all these resources are also um, uh, available on this portal including, of course, all the other uh, French resources, either from Quebec or from uh, 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 Europe or, or, uh, or other places, especially in Africa and the world. The, the, the second initiative that, is, uh, um, that has been launched a couple of months ago, it's uh, something that is called PIX, and do not ask me what PIX means. Uh, I don't think uh, there is any, uh, but what is it? It's a digital skill platform. Uh, children, we have a, a picture here. The idea here is to have a place where you, uh, everyone, 12 years old or 80 years old, can go and test his uh, digital competencies. This is based on, I mean, this follows the digital competency framework from the European Union. And um, then you can go there and you can have evaluation, you can have certification. Uh, it's divided in different topics, so you can just go there because you want to have, let's say, digital culture. And if you go through the different level, then you can really have very strong IT uh, competencies. Um, and this is, some, this is still something in a better uh, uh, way. I mean, but uh, it's going to be, uh, it, it is on li or li live already. You can go there and it will still be improving over the next couple of months. Um, now, I, um, it's interesting that you have been talking about assessment because we, we have um, in France uh, something that I think is a quite incredible um, uh, experiment. Uh, well, the way medical schools are organized in France is that you go to medical school for a couple of years, quite a few years, and at the end, you have to take a national exam. And depending on your um, rank, then you will be able to choose which sort of uh, practice you want to have. So the first one, they can choose if they want to be surgeon or whatever. And then when you go down, uh, well, if you had dreamed to be a surgeon, but all the surgeon places, because there is a, a prerequisite number, are, are done, then you have to choose something else. So for years and years and years, this exam, which concerned basically 8,000 uh, 8, students per year, used to take place in huge room papers, uh, many, many people uh, uh, proctoring the, the rooms, and then afterwards, many medical professors stuck in places, grading, grading and grading, and uh, each paper had to be graded two times or three times. I mean, it was really a huge amount of time, and not necessarily absolutely uh, 
clear, I mean, uh, um, how should I say it in English? Transparent. And well, you know, when, when, you, when you have to grade so many papers, then, and when you know that if you miss half a point, then the guy you get the grade maybe is there and he doesn't have the, 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 the work of his dream, the, the, the speciality of his dream. This is really something. So anyway, last year, they launched this complete transformation. Now, this final medical exam is taken on tablet, and uh, it takes place the same day, so it's still a huge organization. Um, but think about the, in the importance, not only for the, the, the result for the student, but also for the quality of the exam, because on your tablet, you can have, you know, uh, IRM pictures, you can have uh, scanner images, you can have histo histological uh, uh, figures, you can have picture of uh, skin disease, you can have so many things that are much more powerful on your tablet when you are a future doctor than, you know, copied badly on a piece of paper sometimes. So there are quite a, a very, uh, a lot of interesting issues there. Well, of course, uh, we all know that the development of artificial intelligence is a key issue. Uh, learning analytics is very important. This is something that we start doing on the platform. Um, and adaptive learning algorithms are already existent. So what we are also doing on, on, um, on, uh, on our project, on FUN, is that we have a, a project funded by, um, by a national research agency and we are working with a company that has developed adaptive learning algorithm so that we will, you know, inter integrate it in, in, the, in the platform. I believe that the idea today, and I don't remember which one of you had been talking about that, um, the, the, the way, oh, it's, it's you, Brian, the way that you have a platform and there are so many nice tools around, so many new innovation and the way the technologies are built today, then you can plug those innovation with, you know, uh, correct interfaces, correct LTI uh, uh, um, tools that facilitate and really helps to provide a much better learner experience without re-innovating everything from scratch. So I really think that this is uh, uh, very important. And of course, the, the issue is personal learning. Now, for the last couple of minutes, I would like to... Um, give you some ideas of what's going on on, um, on the, the MOOC platform as um, in terms of international relationship and international cooperation. Um, you know that uh, we are French and uh, the French language is something that is quite an impact in the world and uh, we do believe that uh, uh, francophone courses, French courses, have an impact on the francophone world. So, of course, we all know that if, if you look at Africa uh, and the francophone countries of Africa, they have a terrible challenge of, in terms of education, growing number of, uh, of, uh, of students, uh, lack of teachers, uh, lack of buildings to put those teachers in, overcrowded campuses, even though they may have lots of money to create campuses, that by the time they are created, uh, they don't have enough trained teachers to teach the students. So obviously, the only key for them uh, is to, um, to, to go to digital pedagogy and to build their own online courses or to reuse online courses that has been created, for example, on, on the front platform, most of them being in Creative Commons, they have no problem to reuse them. I want to just to show you, uh, to, to give you a, an example to show you the impact of uh, 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 a MOO, what a MOOC can have. Well, the picture here shows um, a, a project that has been running in Rabat University in Morocco. There are 80,000 students in Morocco. And introduction to accounting is a course that is given in many uh, fields, many first year uh, uh, programs. And so what they did two years ago was to create a MOOC on accounting. One of the professors decided, okay, I'm going to do a MOOC. And what's very interesting is that this year, the, the year they did it, some of the students kept taking the regular course, that is to say the campus course with a teacher face-to-face, -face, and other students were required to take the online course. At the end of the year, guess what were the numbers? there were twice as many students that succeed in the, in the MOOC than on regular campus class. So 
uh, I really think that this is a very interesting figure. What you talk, when, when, when I talked to the professors who did this course, uh, they also said that there is an imp uh, a positive impact on it, is that all the students who had been taking, who had been taking this online course, the, the teachers realized that they have improved their French. And this is, as you may know, a quite important issue in, in, in Morocco or in other Francophone countries in Africa because students tend to arrive at university without mastering French. And in, in Morocco, French is the language of the university. So this is a collateral effect, which is very beneficial that when you, when you give to the students the opportunity to take online courses, they can also uh, improve not only the material of the class, but the language. Um, the other thing that I think is very interesting is the fact that um, we have MOOCs on fun. Some of these MOOCs are interesting for Francophone countries, and there are cooperation to reuse these courses. Uh, the example here is an entrepreneurial MOOC. The, the, the title of the MOOC is uh, uh, You wish to, un to wish to an Entrepreneur, something like that. Um, so this course... Uh, is now taught as a MOOC in uh, the program or of four PhD programs in four Moroccan universities. They have decided in their PhD program that this MOOC was a compulsory class for the, uh, the, the future P for the PhD student to take during the, cur the course of their PhD. And uh, of course, what's interesting here is that you are not going to teach exactly the same way entrepreneurship in France that you will do in, in Morocco. So all the questions are, how do you adapt, how to contextualize a MOOC to feel the, 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 the issues of the, the specific issues? Um, and I don't go back to the importance of creative commons on that, of course. Uh, <coughs> We have quite a, quite a few examples of international cooperation. There is something very interesting about MOOCs that um, you can put people together from far away and they can build the course together. The first example is a MOOC on hydrology, where you have teams from France, from Belgium, from Vietnam, from Colombia. Um, and of course you can understand that if on, a dip, in it, on such a course you have examples coming from these different countries, then you, you, you have practical cases that really give even more material to the course. So this is really something that is very interesting. Um, there, is another, um, uh, there is another subject that is quite interesting. Um, the impact of these courses uh, in uh, Francophone countries in terms of continuous education. I'm giving you an example here of courses in uh, public health. Uh, the, th this place here, the Centre Virchaud Villermé, it's uh, an organization that is created uh, between a, a Parisian university, a faculty of medicine, and a Berlin University, La Charité à Berlin. So it's a center of, uh, uh, on, on public health, and they have decided that they are not going only to do research, but they are also going to do um, uh, teaching, but not primary teaching, continuous education teaching. And they have produced uh, several MOOCs. This one here is on um, respiratory syndrome, you know, this huge uh, epidemic that uh, was running in 2013. The other one is uh, dealing with chikungunya, which is also a disease that has been very high uh, in the records uh, around 2010-13. And why I'm telling you here is that, of course, these two MOOCs have been quite successful but they have mainly been successful at the international level and lots of um, uh, you know, people working in the medical fields, uh, nurses or doctors have been following this MOOC because they really provided very important information for them. Um, one, one, other, uh, one other interesting outcome of doing MOOCs is uh, the way you can um, obviously uh, encourage student mobility which is not, not, not something new, of course. But uh, what I feel it's interesting is that um, on this epidemiology course, um, two months after it was done, the number of uh, applications to the master program 
was twice as high as it used to be the previous year, uh, which everyone could, uh, of course, imagine. Um, what is interesting, furthermore, is that in, in the application, there were two students from Madagascar. And those students from Madagascar, they have been taken in the, in the master program. And the professor who was dealing with the course here said that the year before, he wouldn't have taken the risk to take these two uh, students from Madagascar because he wasn't completely sure that they would be uh, you know, s good enough to succeed in the course. And you don't take a, a, a 10,000 flight to take a student away from home if you are not confident enough that he will succeed. And these two students, he took them because they had taken the MOOC, they had succeeded in the MOOC, and that is some sort of collateral effect that makes me quite confident that um, even if there are lots of problems, there are really very interesting issues about that. Well, these are some sort of conclusion. Of course, we all know that um, that has great impact on the students. Um, uh, they are really expecting a lot about that. Um, uh, we know that student engagement is better secured when you have good online courses, even though there are issues of that we have discussed before. Um, it had been said this morning, but of course, uh, the challenge is for the professor, it's for the institution, it's for the government, it's for the EU, uh, uh, if, we, if we go even farther. Um, it's, in my opinion, and in the opinion of most of you, I believe, uh, a chance for developing country, an opportunity to, for our university to reinforce cooperation with developing countries. We are used to have research cooperation with developing countries. There is a way here to go further and have teaching cooperation with developing countries. And I really think that this is absolutely important. I'm not going to go back to, to the first words and the first slide that Brian said about what's happening in the world. So education is really uh, a key issue. And of course, open education is definitely uh, uh, an important, important issue. Thank you.